and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad that you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We're going to be speaking about money, and we're going to be speaking about prosperity. We have with us two international experts on the subject, Phil Lott, the author of Money is My Friend, and Fred Lehrman. They are associates and colleagues and friends for many years, and they've been involved in things as wide-ranging as rebirthing to running prosperity seminars across the world. So they're joining us today so to speak about the whole subject of prosperity consciousness and how we all can benefit from that. And God knows we need to. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show, Phil. Thank you, Mitchell. And Fred. It's good to be here. Good, good. So, what is it that got you into this in the very first place? Basically, uh, interest. I just followed my interest. I was always, I'm, in, I'm interested in money. I'm interested in money from the personal point of view. I'm interested in why my parents didn't have any and why they struggled so much with it. It seemed like a big struggle for them. Mm -hmm. And so I began investigating it in, in the mid-70s. Mm. And so now you must be teeming with money I'm, and uh, doing very, very well. I'm doing very well, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. I, better and better. I see. And Fred, what, what is it that incited you about this? Is it the obvious lure of money and the material realm? Actually, almost the opposite. Uh, I was a professional musician, classical musician, and uh, stayed away from anything technical or financial as long as possible because my father handled that kind of stuff and I did not want to be at all like him. <laughs> and uh, a student of mine asked me to go to uh, listen to a lecture about money psychology because he was not going to be able to make it. He was out of town, so I volunteered to undertake this uh, unpleasant task. And I found that the ideas presented were actually fascinating to me because I'm interested in how the mind works and I'm interested in how people work. Mm -hmm. And money is a very good indicator of both things. I became fascinated because of the psychological and the social aspects of it. Yes. And so that's what pulled me in, and, and the results have been very good for me, too. Mm -hmm. well, God bless. It's, it seems that it's funny, because being in the world that we're in, uh, the subject of prosperity consciousness has become quite popular for some many obvious reasons. And it's funny, because I feel like I've come across or observed a number of people in the field who are not prosperous. And in a sense, they're almost using the ideas of prosperity to pull themselves up and teaching it. Mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure for me to come across people who are teaching it and are and successful. Mm -hmm. So welcome. Thank Very you. Very glad to have Thank you. Thank you. So what is it, Phil, that you find is the first thing that a person has to deal with when they head on the road of increasing their prosperity? Well, there's actually a couple of things. I think one is the idea that money is much more emotional than you suspect. And I would describe Money is My Friend as a book about the emotional aspects and the psychological aspects of earning, spending, saving, and investing. And I've taught seminars about sex, and I've taught seminars about money, and the ones about money are actually more emotional. <laughs> you could say maybe perhaps so because of the, it's, not, it's unexpected. But there's a whole lot of visceral emotions uh, related to survival that we have around money that yes. may come up as a as a surprise for people and security yes okay survival security yes agreed so that's that's one thing is to realize that your feelings about money are very important the other thing to realize is that most people spent 20,000 meals with parents that didn't have the right information about money and so you absorbed their psychology you absorbed their habits you their absorbed attitudes. you absorbed a a sense of loyalty, unconscious loyalty to them. And so when you start breaking free of those patterns and habits, mm. you're going to feel like you're a traitor. It, feel, it, it may feel a little uncomfortable. You, in order to improve your financial life, it's almost necessary, imperative, that you step outside your comfort zone. And so it's, that's either very upsetting for people or very exciting for people, depending mm -hmm. on, on your, your frame of mind about it their psychological orientation. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And do you find that when people attend the workshops, now let me, actually this is a good moment to say that you are both collaborating in the offering of workshops in New York City and elsewhere, I take it? That's correct. And yes. it's called Mastering of Money series? We have a Money Mastery series uh, four, which is a series of four talks throughout the spring of year 2000 here in New York. Mm -hmm. Fred and I working together. 2001. 2001, 2001. I'm sorry, excuse <laughs> wow. me. 
That's right. Yeah, time does fly. It really it? is. <laughs> and March is on. After this, after doing sex and money, do one on time. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. We need more of that. Maybe even more than money, you know? <laughs> yes. Fred, could you just comment a little bit on what has been the obstacles that you've seen people deal with primarily when they yeah. come and want to make some changes? Well, the big issue for most people, they think it's money, but it really is identity. Um, we have a sense of ourselves which is based on how we felt when we grow when we grew up yeah and usually that includes all the stresses of the family environment and then when you're on your own when perhaps maybe you start making a lot of money that picture changes radically and until you are give yourself permission to in fact expand out from that old role that you played as a child whatever you function you served in the family soap opera, I call it, mm -hmm. uh, you will tend to use money, even if you have quite a bit of it, to recreate the same stress patterns. And, and you'll manipulate your environment, your relationships, your work situation, your health, all of the factors in your life. So you'll feel the same kind of anxiety, pressure, and, and uh, obstruction, even though you may have a lot of money. Now, there's some people who do it the other way by keeping themselves from having money so they can feel that life isn't rolling smoothly. And then there's the other form of it, which is you have plenty of money and you unconsciously use it very precisely to set up the same problems again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So that's the resistance. You have to get people to stop taking themselves personally and start yeah. being free to improvise yeah. on who they, who they present yeah, themselves. Expand as. their sense of identity and, exactly. and attachment, interestingly. Right. Sure. It's interesting that money really is, and I, I'm sure you two would concur, energy after all money yes. is energy that's right just like we have bodily energy mm -hmm. that we talk about as life force or chi or what have mm -hmm. you right how is it and how would you describe the relationship between the way people manage their bodily energy and that economy if you will and the economy they have facing dollars in the bank well, um, my, my own, I, I like the money, I got a money, M-O-N-E-Y is, is my, my own, um, my own necessary uh, uh, energy yield. So in other words, that comes back from, from your own, mm -hmm. from your own, from your own, uh, from your own yield, yeah. from your own energy. And so what you do with money is you, is when you put it out, you kind of put your, Put it to work over here for yourself. Investing is the idea that you put it to work over, and it, it works for you. It's it, it's by all by itself doing this little stuff that you would do, if you know, with your own daily activity. And so the money is very similar to that, very similar to the energy thing. And a lot of people have the idea that I need to continue to struggle. In other words, I never have enough energy. I never have enough money. Life is a struggle, and that's exactly what happens with their money. And so the 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 money pattern is is a reflection of your internal your internal structure, your internal thinking, and, and how you deal with your feelings and your energy. And your feelings are just passion. Your feelings are, are passion that we've given names to. And when you stop complaining about your feelings and realize that your feelings are a paradox. There's a very important paradox about your feelings, which is they're all valid and they don't mean anything. They're just passion that we've given names to. And so you start having your feelings instead of allowing them to have you and letting them be okay, you've got all this, this energy that you didn't have before left over that you can start moving forward with. Mm. So divest of the investment in our emotions. Yes, you could yes, say. <laughs> yes, they don't mean anything. They're like weather on the inside. What does it mean when it rains? Does, does it mean anything? Right. So it is us who, of course, attribute the meaning mm -hmm. to the feelings in the first place. Right. So you're, in a sense, saying, pull that back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fred, have you noticed that when people expend their energy a lot. I mean, after all, you have been a, a teacher of Tai Chi Chuan and you've mm -hmm. been very involved in the mastery of the body and the chi system. Is there a relationship between the squandering, let's say, of chi, the expenditure of chi, and the expenditure of money? I think so. Uh, you see... Or a hoarding, the, the for idea, that matter. The idea is it's one, it's one of, of getting the most bang for the buck. And uh, you can spend a lot of money with very little satisfaction, or you can spend very little money with extreme pleasure and, and fulfillment. Yes. And uh, when people are constantly looking for fulfillment and, and uh, not really giving themselves 
the nurturing or the self-acknowledgement or the self-value, and they try to find it out there by buying fancy cars or whatever, they're always feeling not quite there. And, and I tell people, you'll never have enough of what you don't really need to make you happy. Mm. You know, so what yes, you really yes. need is a, is a sense of internal value and well-being. And when you have that, then you tend to use money in quite a different way. You use money where it counts. And you aren't tight with it at all because you know that you, your value will continue to produce income for you and that your service will continue to be recognized. When you're have dubious about that, then you tend to be compulsive about always trying to get acknowledgement in the form of money. And it's, it's kind of like a hamster on a wheel. Mm -hmm. If the wheel stops, then you spend money in a way that is always satisfying and there's no guilt attached to it. So it's a really complete flip or switch of the whole way your internal money metabolism is connected. And it's very analogous to, mm. to health. Yes. So it does relate to Tai Chi and to health. Yes. Money metabolism. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A Never clever turn of phrase. That way. Right. <laughs> Indeed. Double M. <laughs> like, a very efficient uh, engine, you know, and, and uh, works better. Yes, exactly. Efficient. Well lubricated, yeah. as it were. Yeah. It's not something. So what do you find the experiences are in the people who attend your workshops? Well, they're, they're as different as the people. Uh, it, and so to, you can generalize a little bit by saying that uh, people typically go through surprise, which is, and one surprise is that, th that they've done so well with all of this negative thinking and energy that they have about it. And um, the other is the realize, realization of how little it takes to improve. And, and you see, the way I describe your money life is, if you have a 747 flying along at 600 miles an hour, and you take a pencil and you stick it out the window, it changes how the plane flies a lot, mm -hmm. that little pencil. And so you don't have to change everything. You don't have to, you are probably doing a lot of things right. Most people are doing a lot of things right. And there's a few little areas where they're out of harmony and they give themselves a hard time about it or their thinking is backwards. Um, I've seen people that have, their parents had a lot of arguments about money. So their mind has this simple idea, well, the way to have peace and the way to have harmony is to have no money. Money causes all. Money doesn't necessarily cause arguments. It may cause arguments if you think it does. So it's a matter of attitude. And so you just change a little bit of your thinking and the results could be pretty amazing. Sure. Now, what about uh, the situation where you've both traveled the world extensively? You've been in places, rural places in different parts of Europe or Asia or Eastern Europe, no doubt, South America where people have very little money, no matter what the currency. Very, yes. very little physical money. And they eat, and they seem to eat uh, often reasonably well. In some in cases, fact, better. Some, yes. <laughs> Excuse me, yes. But, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's true, it's organic. It doesn't yes. need to be certified, yeah, right. you know. It's not um, packaged. Right, exactly. And they're living very close to the earth. And mm -hmm. There's no money to speak of, but the people are deeply rich. Could you just speak to that? Because it's one of those paradoxes that is facing us now in the world more and more mm -hmm. as the rich get richer and the poor have more babies. Right. Well, this is one of the reasons why this topic is exciting to me because yeah. it connects to social dynamics and change. And it's critical that we stamp out poverty thinking in order yes. for the planet to thrive. Poverty thinking is not the same as financial poverty. It's this sense of lack, scarcity, and so on. Rather than thinking of nature as abundant, the planet as abundant, I think Buckminster Fuller demonstrated in his research and statistics that the planet can support a very high level standard of living um, if we use the resources correctly. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen when people are constantly looking for territorial control in order to defend themselves from all those people who are trying to get their stuff. So. Um, it's a profound question. It has to do not only with use of resources, but again with identity, with social identity, with time, uh, how time is allocated. And uh, uh, my father used to say, he, he who has enough is rich. And enough is a very flexible thing. Uh, sure. And, and uh, so when you go to a country where people have a, a natural rhythm in their lifestyle, which may be related to the land or their activities or their family or their social cycles where they have festivals and there's a community. These people uh, are thriving. If they have more money, they'll be able to use it responsibly. But their focus is not on 
the, the financial side of life. It's on what's important to do. And a lot of these societies work very, very hard for short periods of time during the year, and then they play and party the rest of the time. Uh, and we As would think in that Bali, for instance. In Bali and Ladakh, they used to yes. farm for two months, and then it was too cold to farm, so they just had parties all through most of the winter, yeah. 10 months of the year, and, and the culture went on century after century. Religious like festivals. That. Right. Now, are these people poor, or do they know something we need to think about? Mm. <laughs> something I wish they taught the World Bank, right. actually. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And we also, one other thing that uh, I've seen is that certain types of economies tend to create need. Now, an oil-based economy, the kind that we're in, tends to create this kind of constant scarcity. But when you use renewable energy, solar energy, or whatever, the whole culture seems to go into a much more relaxed state because that stuff is endlessly there. Mm. And, uh, and these experiments have been done on some primitive, quote, primitive cultures that have skipped over the oil economy and gone directly to renewable energy, wind energy so? and sun. And uh, Such they're as doing what? very well. Ladakh is one place, and mm -hmm. there was a woman named Helena Norbert Hodge who won a prize for, for this work that she did there in Ladakh where she Was she taught the, them the how linguist? To, she's she's a Norwegian, I believe. Uh, but she she uh, I don't know whether she was a linguist. I maybe I, I don't mm -hmm. remember all the things about her, but she went there and she saw that as soon as a road came up to this remote kingdom and brought trucks and gasoline, all the kids started leaving drinking Coca Cola and wanting television and, and you know, C D players. Uh, and forgetting about their culture. The moment they put uh, wind energy and solar energy there and stopped relying on the oil, everything kind of settled down again. A very mm. interesting thing. So it's possible so to skip over this whole industrial revolution that Western culture has been through and go directly into the future. And um, the, the, the money issues in that society are related to the energy. So mm. Very interesting. Yeah. Especially because money is energy. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, it is. So, and we are talking about it as a renewable resource essentially mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I mean, we see that I mean well the circulation of it makes it renewable it's not it's not infinite but it's essentially infinite cycles sure so it doesn't have to be infinite for that for there to be the experience of it of it being infinite well as long as you have a printing press it can be infinite yes but you don't even need a printing press for it to be infinite because it goes around yes it's always in circulation right. uh -huh. absolutely well let me ask a kind of a very basic question that uh -huh. I have no doubt many members of the audience would like to know uh, since everybody relates to this subject on their own level. Uh, people might say, oh, a money seminar. Uh, does that mean that if I go, I will learn how to make, or will I end up making, earning, attracting more money? Well, it depends on how well you apply it, applications, everything. But yes, you're going to learn how to do it. And uh, it's, it's actually much easier than most people think. It, it just is not that big a deal. Most people have it mocked up as the mm -hmm. way way more important, most people, Americans anyway, are out of balance in that they, they make it more important than it really is. And it's way more important to have work that you love, have work that you love, and yes. then figure out how to make that into a, into a paying proposition. But you see, it's, I'm picking up on what Fred said, you never get enough of what you really want. If you're doing work for the money, then you'll never, be able, you'll never get enough money because you're always looking for the reward. You take the money that you get from doing the work that you didn't like and you use it as to reward yourself for doing this work that you didn't like, and so mm -hmm. there's, never, it, it, there's never enough. But if you're doing the work that you love, you're already from a point of view of winning. You've already won. Well, that's payment in itself. Exactly right. I say this to people all the time. Sure, yes. So, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, it has to do with vocation. Yes. Literally, yes. which is a calling yes. uh, to perform in the world, to mm -hmm. be someone in the world and forge an identity therein. I think one of the surprises that people have at our seminars is we don't talk about money in the sense that we don't talk about numbers. It's not about this much a month and that much a week and, and all of that. It's about what's going on inside of you. And so it, it's, mm -hmm. we, we, we really t uh, discuss a lot of how you relate to money. It's a relationship. That's yes. why I gave the book the title, Money is My Friend. It's sure. a relationship. We have a relationship Let's with show money. that again. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. This has been printed in what, 14 or 16? F 15, 15 foreign languages, yes. And I, and I believe it. Right that's, in the middle. <laughs> yeah. That's because it addresses the issues at the emotional, gut level, human level, rather than at the level of the culture. 
Absolutely. It's yeah. a psyche. Yes. It deals with, right. I mean, it's not whether it's yen or shekels right. or dollars. It's, right. it's about yeah. one's relationship, in a sense, to the material world, mm-hmm. to the outer world altogether. Yes. And as you both keep saying, to one's identity mm-hmm. and who one is relative to that world and to oneself and one's past. You know? Yes. It's a tricky matter, but it really, it's really wonderful that you're focusing on it because it, it's one of those pivotal areas in life. Mm-hmm. As you said, sex and money, you know, and sometimes religion, sometimes politics. You yes, know. It's sometimes. Just, it's very self-revealing, mm-hmm. isn't it? This whole subject, actually, of um, forging a new culture and in within a new paradigm, I think, is something of utter importance as we find ourselves on this precipice of utterly putting our resources, uh, well, they're putting us out in such a way that our air is almost not breathable anymore here in New York City and elsewhere. And we are just trashing our environment, something so terribly. And it's all based, as we know well, on the use of fossil fuels and the abuse of our natural resources. Have you been thinking about ways that you could use this this seminar that you're teaching to kind of upgrade people's thinking about the larger macro economy, so to speak? Well, I mean, it is an environment. We create, you create an environment with your money, and, and, and a lot of the, the patterns from our parental upbringing are unconscious. And so as you, be, as you become more conscious about what you're doing with money and what you're doing with your life and what you're doing with your energy, you become more conscious of the consequences that your behavior has. That's, that's what I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Understandably. Mm-hmm. Sure. Would you yeah. respond to that, Fred? The, the uh, changes in values that happen when people stop the run on the wheel long enough to mm-hmm. kind of settle down and, and wake up and see what's been running their their impulses, the kind of false emergency that they're always living in. Yes. Uh, at the moment you begin to uh, shut down some of those old automatic programs and replace them with things which are much more chosen, chosen because they have benefit not just for oneself, because one doesn't see oneself anymore as being an isolated entity, you know, you against the world, that's a very hard way to live. Sure. It's much better to s- the, me and the world as one. And when I do something that benefits myself, I benefit the environment. When I do something that benefits the environment, I benefit myself. When I do something that benefits to my community, I benefit myself. So the whole uh, way in which things interact and fit together and the way choices get made socially shifts relative to this question of prosperity consciousness. Prosperity consciousness is not just the technology of how to make money jump through hoops. That's, that's finance. That's not yes. prosperity. Prosperity is the sense of uh, safety in the universe and well-being being who you are. Those are the keys of prosperity. So when, you're, when your priorities shift in that way and you've learned the kind of stuff that we talk about that allows you to identify what's been running you, it's a whole new vehicle. And, uh, and I think it's critical in order to turn social yeah. tendencies in a new direction. Sure, sure. I mean, all change, as you know, uh, Donnie Epstein said, we change a spine at a time, the network chiropractor, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how they're changing the world, mm-hmm. the spine that's at a right. time. So, in fact, change does play, take place first locally and yes. then globally. It's uh, one of those kinds of effects, you know. Uh, what is it that you find now that you are in the middle of, let's say, you're, you're being a teacher mm-hmm. of this kind of material and consultant that has been one of the most rewarding experiences that you've had? Well, the thing that, the thing that rewards me the most is people's stories. They say, you know, they're, they're success stories. They, they send emails and phone calls about what, what they've done that's very, very different from what they've been doing before. Yeah, like breakthroughs and yes. yeah. lives. And yeah. and so is there one that strikes you that you love to share with the audience? Uh, which one to pick? Uh, well, I have a, a, a... Of the abundance. Right, yeah. I have a, a, a client who's a, a court reporter, and, and it was, it, it's very, very easy to understand. And his, what I saw was that his, um, his income and his contribution was held back by the fact that he was, uh, he had what I called unwarranted perfectionism. Now, perfectionism is a good thing to have if you're a court reporter because you can't make mistakes. But what he had done is he'd taken his perfectionism and spread it all over his life. 
<laughs> and so he had fear of stepping out because he had this fear of making a mistake. And so what I did was I showed him how to pull that back just to his, just to his um, career or where it mattered doing the court reporting and take more risk in the other stuff. And his income increased by a factor of five over about eight weeks. And so that's why I say you put the, you put the pencil out the window of the 747 and it flies very very differently. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's a matter of physics, isn't yes, it? Yes, <laughs> it know, is. After all, you know. yeah, Fred, I, anything I, that I, occurs many to you? Stories also, and, and sure. I, uh, the one that amuses me the most always is <laughs> on my tapes. I have very specific steps: do this, do this, do this, and you will see a change. We should let people know, by the way, that your your tape series on. On prosperity have been put out by Nightingale Conant. Right, so and it's prosperity a, consciousness, and and you know people come to me and sometimes say, "Have you written a book?" I say, "No, Phil wrote the book. Read the book. <laughs> listen to the tapes. They're yes. saying the same Which, thing, whichever you prefer. Style, right. Exactly. Book. One's uh, visual, one's audio. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, uh, if people do these steps, they see results. But I had a call once from somebody who said, "You know, I got your tapes, and I uh, listened to them, and I listened to them twice." And they didn't do anything that you suggested, but my income doubled anyway. <laughs> so I said, "That's just fine, you know, it's absolutely fine." And, uh, and and that that does happen because there is a subliminal shift that takes place. The outer actions are there simply to reinforce it. So uh, I don't mind it when people tell me that. And I've had people tell me they've tripled their income from listening to the tapes, and and uh, they started out at a high income. So I know it works mm. not just for people who are struggling, but for people who are already successful. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Isn't that interesting? Just possibly a slight shift in the subconscious right. can open that's up right. that gateway exactly. to plenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Your last comments that you would like to make to our audience, I mean, in giving them some advice from uh, on high. Well, I, I think that, that it's the realization is that we're unlimited. And, and the, the worst mistake you can make in your life is to sell your dreams short. And think that you're going to just you know get by, go for it, 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 and be satisfied with what you have. Even if you're bleeding, but you're not bleeding to death, then the tendency is to be satisfied with that, and that's uh, that's uh, that's a big mistake in my view. Mm. Go for more. Yes, go yeah. for more. Yeah. Express yourself the way you have something unique to to contribute, and go for that. Thank you, thank you. And one last comment, if yeah, you would make, I, Fred. I would say to people that if if you want to help the world, uh, it's, you can do more if you're rich. You can actually do more faster. So be the first on your block to stamp out poverty thinking and, and uh, then help everybody else. And you'll find that you have much better results. That's wonderful. Fred, thank you. pleasure to have you. Phil, Mitchell, great thank to you. have you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you Keep much. up your good work. It's <laughs> thank you. a real contribution to the world. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I hope you all feel richer now after all that. I know I do. <laughs> uh, this is Mitchell J. Raven for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you all next week.